Welcome everyone. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. All right, let's get started. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Friday seminar. My name is Steve Devlin. I'm the director of the master's in data science program here at USF. I think we have at least a few visitors out there. So uh, nice to see you, welcome. This is actually um, gonna be our last seminar for the semester. Um, we had a little, we had one cancellation uh, for next time and then some schedule changes around uh, Thanksgiving week with COVID and everything. So I think we will uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone again starting up in the spring. Um, all right, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, so we will uh, hear today from Michael Ruddy. Uh, Michael is a postdoctoral fellow here at the Data Institute at USF. Um, and before that, um, Michael was a uh, postdoctoral um, researcher at the uh, Max Planck Institute um, in Germany. Um, Michael has uh, pretty broad and diverse interests. Um, he has a uh, background and interest in uh, applied algebraic and differential geometry um, and applications to data science. He did his PhD at NC State, um, and he's going to talk to us today about deep learning for image analysis. Uh, so we're really happy to have Michael talking to us today. Um, one quick announcement before we get started about questions. Um, please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, I think the plan today is to be um, a little bit more interactive than we have been in the past. So there are going to be a few places Along the way, we're, we're gonna pause, uh, hopefully, and, and bring up some questions. Um, so I'll keep tabs on the Q&A um, and the chat. Um, but if you do have a question, uh, go ahead and type it in in real time, uh, and hopefully we'll get to that question sooner rather than later. Um, so sounds good. And uh, let's, without any further delay, let's uh, welcome Michael. Great, well, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. All right, yeah, so as you see on the screen, uh, today I'll talk about deep learning for image analysis. Uh, and as mentioned, this is sort of more of a lecture than a research talk. So I hope to um, sort of give some intuition on neural networks, why you would want to use them for images. Um, yeah, so please, again, please ask questions. Uh, so the way uh, this is structured, I'll first talk a little bit about why one should care about deep learning. I'll share some of my favorite sort of coolest examples of the power of neural networks. Uh, then I'll spend quite a bit of time giving some intuition for what a neural network is, maybe how it works. Uh, and I'll talk about neural networks specifically for imaging, uh, some of the common tasks in the context of uh, a practicum project actually. And then I'll end talking just a little bit about where deep learning for imaging might be going and a particularly challenging project uh, that I'm working on right now that I find uh, really cool. I hope you do too. Okay, so why should you care about deep learning? Why should you know what it is? Why should you be interested in learning more about it? Um, the first reason is that uh, it works. Uh, it works really well, and I'll show you a few examples of this. Um, the second is that uh, the pace of progress in deep learning is fast, and it doesn't seem to be uh, slowing down anytime soon. Um, which means that people who can use and understand deep learning and neural networks are quite in, in high demand. 
Uh, so here is a first example, um, uh, nice imaging example. There are some black and white images shown on the top here that have been colorized using a deep learning model. So here we can sort of bring to life um, a now extinct animal, see it in what it might have looked like in color, a picture by Ansel Adams, just a regular family photo, and a picture by Dorothea Long, Lange. Uh, here are some examples of completely synthetic photos created by a neural network. So all of these photos are not actual photos of any, um, anything in real life. They were images generated at different resolutions by a neural network. I actually particularly like this last one because this was sort of a, uh, an output sort of in the middle of training, so before the model was finished. And so you get this sort of weird combination of what might be a dog and a tennis ball. Uh, even past images, deep learning is becoming incredibly effective with video. So this is a completely synthetic uh, video of President Obama. Okay, here's an ad, which is recommended to me. This is also deep learning. Don't think too hard about why I'm getting a deodorant ad. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time even if they would never say those things. Okay, so I won't show the full video, but it's uh, a synthetic video of President Obama lip syncing over an impersonation by Jordan Peele. So I, I find it quite humorous, although I will warrant some profanity if you wanna watch it later. Uh, and finally, here's deep, deep learning at work with text. You all might've seen this in your Gmail. Uh, in setting up this webinar, Kirsten sent me this email saying, you know, you should receive a link to join. We'll see you tomorrow and Google has read this email and suggested a few uh, responses for me, which I think are quite polite and uh, reasonable. Okay, so hopefully that convinces you that deep learning is doing some amazing things. Um, here I have a few examples of just how fast uh, this is really progressing. So the chart on the left shows you um, sort of error rates at different years for the ImageNet challenge. So ImageNet is a very large database of images uh, with a thousand different classes. So dog, cat, plane, et cetera. And the challenge each year was to use this database to create a model. And then uh, this model would be evaluated on a secret test set and you would have some winner who performed the best. So we see that the error goes down from 28% in 2010, all the way down to three and a half percent in 2015. And now they do not run the challenge anymore because uh, our models are just too good. Similarly, in natural language processing, uh, in 2013, 2014, you have deep learning becoming popular with recurrent neural networks. And then in 2017 and 18, uh, some major breakthroughs. Uh, nowadays, these models are able to comb large portions of the internet, like Wikipedia, um, to sort of pre-train for lots of tasks. Okay. So they're able to sort of effectively use completely unlabeled data um, to do very incredible things. All right, so we need a lot of people who can construct neural networks to solve problems. Okay, so that's sort of the technical expertise. Uh, training neural networks can be described as a sort of art. Um, even the best pre-trained models need to be fine-tuned. So these aren't sorts of things where someone creates a model and now sort of out of the box, you can use this for whatever task you wanna do. Um, while you can pre-train models and sort of fine-tune them to your task, you do need people who sort of understand what's going on and have intuition for how to make this work really well. Uh, we also need more theoretical understanding of neural networks. One of the major sort of complaints I hear from uh, academics, at least in the mathematics community, is that neural networks are too much of a black box. You know, we give it an input and then something happens and we have a nice wonderful output, but we don't, can't see or understand what happened in between. Now, a lot of interesting work is happening in this area, but I think many people would agree that there needs to be more. And definitely this is an area where a lot of creativity and understanding would be needed. In fact, these tasks need to be solved so much that there's even a whole website dedicated to machine learning competitions, Kaggle. Um, so here's a, a screenshot of an imaging competition sponsored by Lyft, which they will give you $30,000 if you happen to win. 
and a nice uh, text based uh, challenge sponsored by Kaggle. Okay. And these are actually active yesterday. So if you want, you're still time to get in there. So uh, what is a neural network and why does it work? So to explain this, I'm gonna look at sort of a toy task. Uh, a classic first imaging task is to classify photos into either cat or dog. So I'm gonna look at this task, but to make it a bit more interesting, I'll do a twist. So instead of an image of a cat or dog, we'll say that you're a zoo archeologist and you're given a fossilized femur, you measure its length and you measure its weight. And then from this, you want to predict, uh, is this a canine or feline uh, animal bone? So let's say you do this for a bunch of these fossils and you get the data on the right. Okay. So I've, I've completely fabricated this data um, using my potentially flawed intuition that perhaps cat bones are a bit less dense than uh, canine bones. Right? Um, so I'm sort of imagining maybe two clusters here, you know, maybe house cats and, uh, and big cats. Okay. So what is our goal here? Our goal is to fit a model that predicts based on length and weight, whether what we're looking at is cat or dog, okay? So I wanna fit a function to this data that I've been given. I want it to sort of approximate a cat or dog based on this, this spread here. So let's say we wanna find a function f that takes in length and weight, and it outputs a negative value if it's a cat and a positive value if it's a dog. Okay. So the simplest non-trivial function we can use uh, to do this is a linear function. And from the data, this actually looks like a linear function works pretty well. So here's my best guess for a linear function. And when I say a linear function, I mean some value times the length plus some value times the weight plus some, some constant here. Okay. So this black line represents uh, the decision boundary or where the line is zero. Okay. And then above this line, we have positive values. So we're classifying dogs. And below this line, we have negative values so we're classifying cats. Okay. Now, even here, this line isn't perfect. We see that uh, we have a dog or two in the cat region. Maybe we have some, some outliers here. And then if we're given a new data point, say this, this uh, we measure some new femur, our model would predict that this is in fact a canine femur. So I'll stop here if there are any questions so far. I think not yet, Michael, We're still good to go. Okay. All right, so to sum up here, we're trying to classify dog and cat, and I have constructed some linear model uh, to, to do this. Okay. Now in reality, we probably won't be able to get away with, with a linear model. Uh, so maybe we have a more realistic spread here. Um, here, my, my intuition is that maybe dog breeds are a bit more variable than cat breeds. We get some spread like this here. So really with this data, there's no real satisfying way to use a linear slice to classify these regions into to cat or dog. However, I could potentially use two linear slices to start getting an intuition, to start getting a, a much uh, a better approximate model for this boundary here, okay? So while this boundary, the, here doesn't look very linear, I can use two linear slices to sort of approximate it. So for fun, we'll sort of say that these linear models represent two zoo archeologists' best guesses for how to draw a decision boundary. You know, maybe expert one thinks the weight is really the defining characteristic. So he places the, the slice here. Maybe expert two likes uh, what we did on the previous slide a bit more. So he approximates uh, some line here, okay? So these are sort of two guesses for a linear model and neither of them seem to be perfect. They seem to be sort of classifying a lot of dogs into the cat region. Okay. Now, without looking at the raw data theirself, a third expert might come along and based on expert one and two's decisions, uh, make a guess. So expert three might say, if one and two both agree that it's a feline femur, then I agree, then it's a cat. Otherwise, I'll say it's a dog. So along with these two linear functions, and then a third expert, which is sort of represents a conditional statement, uh, we can sort of approximate a more complicated decision boundary here, right? So I've taken two linear slices, and then a third expert has made a decision based on, 
on these two different linear slices. So putting this together, we can sort of visualize it in this way, which might seem a bit suggestive since we're talking about neural networks, and I hope it does. So expert one and two look at the length and the weight, and using these features on the bone, they make a decision, uh, a linear decision, on how they think uh, the model should look, right? Expert one makes this slice, expert two makes this slice in the model. Then what expert three does is relies on expert one and two to make their decision on um, drawing the boundary between cat and dog. Okay. So we have this sort of tiered interaction. Expert one and two take in length and weight. Expert three takes in the opinions of expert one and two. Oh, are there any questions so far? Not quite yet, Michael, too clear. I'll keep pausing awkwardly until it happens. Maybe that'll force them out. Okay. I, I will not be bullied into not pausing for questions. Okay, so now we can sort of look at this linear model and introduce a little bit of nonlinearity by normalizing these scores, right? So I have a linear model here. This is where the model is zero. Remember we have some line and above it, it's positive and below it, it's negative. Now to sort of normalize these scores, um, what that means is I'm going to sort of shrink all my positive and negative values into the zero one range. Okay. So I'm gonna do that by feeding my linear function into a sigmoid function. So the sigmoid function takes in very large negative values and outputs something close to zero takes in zero, outputs 0.5, takes very large positive values and outputs something close to one. So it sort of shrinks the range of possible values from negative infinity to positive infinity to zero to one. So this sort of keeps our, our scores nice and compact. And when we feed our function, our linear model through the sigmoid function, we get a spread that looks like this. So now the decision boundary is sort of represented by 0.5 and as I go in this way, so as before my scores were decreasing off to negative infinity, now my scores are sort of decreasing to zero, right? But it's no longer linear. You see here, I have a graph of 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, similarly a graph of two, one, 0.05. So now instead of having a model here with a linear increase and decrease, I have a sort of nonlinear increase and decrease. And I can sort of interpret this model as um, a probability now, okay? So if, um, if we have something close to one, we, it looks like we have a dog. If I have something close to zero, it looks like we have a cat. So now our score, we can sort of interpret it as probability it is a dog. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, we got a couple questions here. So right. I will read them to you. Uh, so the first question is, uh, are there any instances where you would have a network looking for something other than an intersection of classification models? Classification models. Um, so I think in reality, we're not going to have a network do this. So this is, so in this toy example, I'm gonna to get to sort of a better version of this. So here we have kind of a conditional statement on uh, the linear slices, right? If, if, uh, if this is positive and this is positive, then this is positive. So in the next slide, I'm gonna show a trick to sort of get rid of these if then statements. I think that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. And then the next question would be, um, is what changes um, if you're in a non-binary classification setting? So in a non-binary classification, um, see, so in the non-binary classification, you'll have more than, okay, so if we do this probability interpretation, right? And we, we sort of, instead of thinking uh, negative and positive, we're outputting a probability it's either cat or dog. So instead of one output, you know, representing probability as a dog, we might get a multi-tiered output. Like, um, I guess I could re reformat this to two bubbles, one for cat, one for dog, and have one output probability cat, the other output probability dog. And so for, for many classes, 
I could sort of feed my, uh, let's say I have 10 classes. I could get 10 scores out and feed these 10 scores through a sigmoid function, not a sigmoid, but a more complicated function that'll turn it into 10 probabilities. So at the end of the day, what I really want is an output that is a probability score. So I think that's sort of how I would tweak this to a multi-class situation. Maybe it'll be a bit more clear when I uh, get through the toy example. All right, I think, I think we can probably push on a little bit. Okay, cool. All right, so to summarize, what we have here now is we have two experts who make a linear guess as to our model based on length and weight of the femur. Their guesses are fed through a sigmoid function, which turns their guesses into probability scores, right? So we introduce some nonlinearity into their linear model. Okay. So in this way, we can actually represent a more complicated nonlinear decision boundary here, sort of cutting in between the red and blue dots as a linear combination of the sigmoid of expert one and the sigmoid of expert two. So rather than a conditional statement, I have just an actual function, which is, you know, a sigmoid of expert one, which is in turn a linear uh, function of length and weight plus sigmoid of expert two, which is a linear function of length and weight. So sort of by taking these two linear functions, passing them through a nonlinearity, we can actually approximate a bottle, a nonlinear model with a pretty good decision boundary here. So here, again, um, I'm sort of thinking about this output now as a probability. So this would be where the model uh, gives a 0.5 score and everything over here is sort of less than 0.5. Everything here is greater than 0.5. If I have more than one class, I'm probably outputting um, for each set of inputs more than one probability. And I'll have a much more complicated picture here. So I'll have sort of a multi-dimensional a model giving multi-dimensional output. Um, and I'm not sure how best to visualize that. Probably need more dimensions here. Okay. And as you might have guessed, this is a very simple example of a neural network. Um, the length and weight of our femur are input features. The middle nodes are the hidden layers. And the output layer represents uh, a final decision. Actually, I should pause again for questions. Did any more come up? Um, yeah, a couple questions. Um, I think I think you're on your way to some of them. So um, okay. I'll, I'll throw them out there and then you can decide if you wanna talk about them or just keep going here. Um, so one question, uh, what if there is no clear num, you know, boundary between red and blue, but I think you're, you're on your way there. Um, and um, let's see, just a couple of others here real quick. Um, uh, sorry, all of a sudden, lots of questions uh, flew in. Oh, um, yeah, so, so one good question. Um, you know, Michael, your, your explanation here is really nice and clear and, and makes it seem like this is all very interpretable. So like, where does this black box, uh, um, uh, you know, criticism uh, come in into play, and I think we're headed there too. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so so I think maybe those are good for now to sort of pause on. Okay, perfect. So the, the one was about where does black box come in, and the first one was, uh, you, was um, boundary. Again? Like, what if what if ah, okay. uh, you know you can't quite see a nonlinear boundary between the points? Okay, yeah, I think. I think I can sort of give an intuition of what, what happens if you can't see it. I think the model will, will make its best guess, right? So there, there might not be one, so there might not be a good model if, uh, based on the data you have. You might need more data to make a, 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 a better one, right? Maybe you have too many outliers. Okay, so in general, we can go from something simple to a little something a bit more, uh, more general. So in general, we might create a complicated neural network and have a diagram, something looking like this. Here we have, instead of one hidden layers, two hidden layers with three nodes each. Okay. 
So as before, each blue node here is a linear function of our two input values. Here are the maybe length and weight again, right? So this blue node is a linear combination of these two. This blue node is a different linear combination of these two uh, and so on. And then as before, we take this input and we feed it through some nonlinearity. Okay? Uh, so before it was a sigmoid, but in practice it can be as simple as just a piecewise linear function. Okay. So I can sort of represent this all abstractly as a matrix multiplication here, right? So here I have an X vector as my input, and then all these linear functions can be summarized by uh, matrix multiplication A1 times X plus vector B1. Okay, so I'm sort of envisioning this as maybe a two by three plus matrix plus something that's three dimensional. So I have a two dimensional input and a three dimensional output. Okay. So after I do the linear transformation of X, I do some nonlinear activation function and then I have my output A1. Okay. And then I do this again. So I take my output from A1 and instead of getting my uh, final output, I feed it through another layer. So here the green node is a linear combination of the outputs here in layer one. This is a different linear combination of these outputs. This third one is a different linear combination of these blue outputs. And so I get another sort of recursive matrix operation. So I have some uh, linear function, linear function being a matrix A2 times A1 plus a vector B2. And again, feed it through nonlinearity until I get to, and I, this goes on for as many layers as I have until I get to my output. So in general, uh, a neural network can be thought of as a sequence of linear functions followed by some nonlinear function in between, sometimes called uh, an activation function. And the nice thing about doing it this way is that with enough nodes, we can actually approximate any function at all uh, in this sense. And I, and I really mean this in a mathematical sense. You know, one can sit down and prove rigorously that um, the space of, you know, if you want to be mathematical, you have the space of all functions, then the functions represented by neural networks is sort of dense in this space where any function I pick is very, very close to being uh, some neural network. And as a side note, uh, the deep and deep learning here comes from uh, more layers, right? So I have layer one and layer two, a deeper network would be something with three hidden layers or four hidden layers. Uh, so why do it this way? Um, there's many potential reasons for this, uh, but I think intuitively one reason is that uh, these linear operations are simple and your computer can do many of them quickly and simultaneously. And speed is important after all, since this is in effect an optimization problem, right? I have some function, unknown parameters here in A1 and B1, and I wanna find the best matrices A and vectors B that, uh, you know, best, best parameters that give us a model that fits uh, our data. So at the end of the day, um, I think the takeaway here is that a neural network can be boiled down to some linear algebra and then a little bit of cal multivariate calculus free optimization. Okay. So if you sort of are somewhat familiar with these two things, then you're well on your way to learning uh, what a neural network is. Okay. I'll stop here for a few more questions. All right. Um, let's see. Um, so how are the number of nodes in each layer determined? Um, that's a good question. So it's determined based on, um, so this is where the intuition comes in. I think, you know, based on what has worked before and your specific task. So there is no, at least none that I know of, feel free to, if, if someone knows, they can correct me. But I don't think there's any mathematical proof of anything that's like, you know, if I'm doing an imaging task, then 12 layers with three nodes is the optimal thing. I think where we see statements like a network with 10 layers and five nodes each is good really comes from experience. So someone has done a lot of these tasks really well using this kind of neural network. And then someone comes along and tweaks it and then shows, you know, now it works really well. So I think the intuition guiding how many layers and how many nodes and how you should design your neural network is um, sort of experimental. So based on 
what is working well rather than mathematically. All right. Um, and a um, similar question on how, um, how you choose the activation functions. Is there a rule there or do there, there need to be certain properties? Um, so in principle, you can choose any activation function you would like. Um, in practice, you probably want to choose the simplest thing that's going to work the best. So, um, you know, I've mentioned the sigmoid function, you can use sort of complicated things, but I, you know, in general, something as simple as a piecewise linear function. So something that is zero on negative values and is X on positive values. So this is called a RELU relu function. And um, so if you see that, that's pretty popular activation function. And I think the rule of thumb is really as simple as you can get while still working well. And, and just, just on that note, um, you know, I said one reason you want to do neural networks this way is because there's a lot of linear things. I, th I think in that same vein, um, you know, you could use polynomials rather than neural networks to approximate any function, but, you know, high degree polynomials are complicated. So if I can use something simpler and get better results or the same results, I think that's always a, a better way to go. Um, Michael, there's a couple of questions um, that I'm going to try to mush together that are sort of um, all kind of uh, trying to go back to your initial example with the experts. Um, mm -hmm. And and like to, to what extent should we be thinking about um, layers in in the neural network as opinions of experts, or or is is it best that we we leave this uh, motivating example behind now? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So I think I'm going to I'm going to introduce a better way of thinking about what these nodes are doing in the next slide. So I think. In some sense, we do want to move away from experts and move towards these neural networks are computing things it finds important. I think that's sort of the general idea. They, these nodes are finds this important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, one one more question. Then I think we should we should push on a little bit, and I'll I'll we've got lots here, and I'll co we'll come back to some. But um, so so given this idea that you know any function can be approximated this way. Um, um, how, do we, how do we know or prevent overfitting in that context? Um, so there are a lot of tips and tricks to do this. Um, one way is to, so you definitely have to have a, a validation set. So let's say you're, you're looking at some data and I'm fitting a model to this data. Well, you definitely wanna keep some data in your back pocket that your model hasn't seen to evaluate uh, what you're doing. Right. Um, you know, beyond that, it, it's actually a difficult question. You know, how do you prevent overfitting? So this is sort of like a almost a philosophical question, and it, it's a good one because it's a it's an issue that you one has to think about when constructing neural networks. Great. All right. Let's uh, let's keep going, and I'll I'll keep right. uh, curating here. Okay. So maybe this will answer one of the earlier questions. Um, so why do we call neural networks artificial intelligence? And why do people complain that these things are black boxes? So in the previous example, uh, I took these femurs, right? And I, you know, I had these, these guys here, all the way here. And I said, I'm going to measure the length and measure the weight. And I'm gonna use these to make my decision whether it's a feline or a canine, okay? Um, but how about instead of doing that, I let my model decide what features are important, right? So instead of inputting the length and the weight, what I might do is say, okay, I'm just gonna take an MRI or a CT scan of these femurs, right? And so I, now I have some image, right? So maybe it's a 3D image, a 2D image, and this is what I give my model. And with enough data, we can let our model sort of decide what is important about the femur, right? Maybe it thinks weight and length are important, but maybe something else is more important, like volume or the size the, of the bone marrow cavity or something like that. So in this sense, uh, us sort of backing away from this decision of what uh, features are important about our data and letting the model sort of just see a lot of raw data and make these decisions are what lend the name artificial intelligence and give this 
sort of black box, right? So here now I'm just giving it this MRI of a, of a bone, feeding it into the network and I'm getting a wonderful output. Okay. So now here's the black box, right? I'm giving it this, right? And it's making a decision for me, right? Before I was giving it a length and a weight and then it was making a decision. Um, that's kind of okay because then if it's doing a good job, we can say, ah, length and weight must be sort of important things to look at. But then here we have less of a sense about what is important about our data for the model to make this decision. Okay. And this is very general. I think there's lots of interesting work being done on trying to see what it is that uh, for various tasks that a model finds important. But in general, this is sort of the black box complaint. Uh, so for instance, this diagram can sort of help gain insight into some features uh, this face detector found important. Okay. So in each box here, we have parts of the image that excites each node the most, right? So here I said that these nodes, we can sort of think about them as being excited by things it finds important. So here sort of visualized are in this face detector. The first layer, we have nodes that are sort of excited by different things, right? And they're very basic things because we remember that these layers are sort of linear functions, so they can't do very much. So we see that it seems like most things in this layer are excited by edges and blobs, right? But then layer two, it, it makes linear guesses based on the features that layer one found important. So based on edges and blobs, layer two might say, ah, you know, I combine a few of these edges and blobs and I really like these eye looking things or noses or uh, I guess foreheads maybe. Right? And then the final layer can sort of look at these, this second layer and maybe from this construct uh, more complicated features. So rather than you know, these experts making decisions, maybe we can think about these nodes as sort of um, finding interesting features or interesting important um, characteristics of our data going forward, which sort of iteratively get more complicated as we get a more complicated function as we, we get through more layers. Okay, um, so in reality, um, so I, what I was talking before about was what we call a fully connected neural network. And I'm gonna, for the interest of time, just quickly go over this, but I wanna, I can't talk about deep learning and imaging without mentioning convolutional neural networks. So in reality, images are a bit too big to use a fully connected network. For instance, a grayscale image like this, right? I can think about it as a matrix of brightness values here from zero to one. So maybe zero is black and one is white. Okay? So a small 256 by 256 grayscale image, it gives an input vector of size, you know, 256 squared, which is quite large. So if I think about something that's 256 squared um, and I have this many nodes here, my neural network's gonna get very big, very complicated, very quickly. So instead we can use what's called a convolutional operation. So this has less parameters and we can replace these fully connected layers with convolution layers. Okay. So again, I'll, I'll try not to go too far into the details, but I just wanna give an intuition on how these work and why they sort of dominate the image analysis scene. Okay. So before we had matrix operations acting on our, our input vector, with convolutional neural networks, we have little blocks of weights acting on our uh, matrix image, uh, input matrices. So I'll think of images as sort of input matrices. Maybe here it's grayscale, so I have one matrix, but for RGB, I'll have sort of three matrices stacked one after the other. And this is still a linear operation, but what it does is we have this sort of block here, multiplying element wise with this top left block to produce this number, right? So one, times one plus zero times 0 0.5 plus zero times zero plus two times 0.25. So if I add that all up, I get 1.1, 1.5. And then I slide this block over. I compute the same thing for this block. I get 1.5. And then I keep doing this up and down the image. And from these four uh, numbers, I go from one matrix to another matrix. Okay. 
And these four numbers are sort of the unknown parameters. So instead of a matrix operation, uh, I have a two by two filter here, which I'll slide up and down left and right through the image to produce uh, a matrix of values, a new matrix of values. Okay. Now this is beneficial for images specifically, um, first because it has less parameters here. I'm going over this whole image and I just have four numbers that I'm multiplying everywhere. The second is that since I'm using the same four numbers over here on the top left and over here on the bottom right, um, I can sort of think about this as detecting features, the same feature in different areas of the image using the same values, right? So maybe this thing here is sort of sliding along the image looking for um, edges or blobs, right? So instead of having, you know, you know, a filter for each part of the image, I have one filter which I slide all around. Right? And then I can pass another filter. And so from one image with eight parameters, I get two input blocks. And then in general, we can think about a convolutional layer as a sequence of these filters applied to a stack of arrays. So maybe this is an RGB image where each pixel has a red, green, blue value. I take this filter and I slide it left and right up and down and I get one green block take another fil filter, slide it around, get another green block. And so each of these blue filters gives me a new square. And thus the new matrix stack gets turned into another uh, matrix stack. And I can pass this through a nonlinear function. And then this is sort of the building block for my convolutional neural network. So instead of a fully connected layer, I have these sequences of filters. And going back to this diagram, perhaps each of these blocks represents uh, these edges or blobs, right? So this block here might correspond to this filter and it'll slide along looking for this uh, diagonal edge. Okay, so I think that's a good point to pause for questions. So we have a couple um, couple leftover questions and maybe that I'll, I'll throw out there. Um, so let's see, uh, one, um, so is it, is it possible to, um, to kind of um, jigger with the architecture of the network so that, you know, one layer is pointing to a linear combination of other layers or some, something like that? You mean, okay, so, so back in the network example, the fully connected example, this, this layer is looking at Linear combinations of oh, like the whole layer. Mm -hmm. I think I'm 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 yeah, not a hundred percent sure what. So um, I think I'll answer that by just saying that yes, because it's quite possible to come up with interesting and new ways of combining these things linearly. And I I think that you know the big the the answer is always going to be yes, and then the the main question is is it working well. Um, right. And, and along the same lines, I've, I've, we've got a lot of questions about just um, how, how big your test set needs to be and how big your training set needs to be, which I'm, I'm sure you have easy answers to. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, these are all very dependent on what you're doing. So I'll, leave, I'll describe a very a particular project and I'll throw out some numbers there. Um, all right. Uh, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep uh, trying to go through questions here. My apologies if I'm if I'm missing one. Uh, I'm doing my best here. Well, lots are rolling in. I think I think it's probably um, uh, a good place to to keep going, uh, okay. and then I'll I'll uh, hopefully get a few more together here. Okay, cool. All right. So I think for the rest of it. Um, that was the most technical details I really want to go into. So I want, to, I want the, the last half to be a, a bit more fun. So what I'm going to do now is talk about a specific imaging project that we've been working on with uh, WL Gore. And you might recognize this from, from Pitch Week. This is one of the projects that was pitched, pitched for a practicum in January that a few of you might actually work on. So the idea is that they've implanted these artificial corneas and eyes and they want to understand the health of the surrounding tissue uh, over time. Here. So in this image, this sort of uh, black area here, this is an artificial cornea device. Right? So they've implanted this into an eye. 
And then what they want to do is sort of with these pictures understand uh, the health of this tissue here, you know, over time, right? They implant it and then maybe a few months later, they want to know, you know, how's it going, right? Or, or, or things still healthy? Are there any issues? And this is kind of a broad question, right? Understand the health of the tissue around uh, artificial device. And I think this is kind of a, a cool project because from this sort of broad and general uh, kind of simple question to ask, it actually leads to many different interesting deep learning tasks uh, for images. Uh, and they all sort of face a major challenge here. Um, and it's that the data is quite expensive to create and label. And this is common with a lot of medical imaging tasks. So compared to something like ImageNet, where the data set is uh, some, something like ImageNet, this data set is very small. So when I say expensive to create, it's expensive to create because these images are taken with uh, a very expensive machine. You know, I can't very well go out into the wild with my iPhone and create images like this. Uh, it's also time consuming to label these images because only someone who really understands what's going on can do this, right? It, it's expensive to sort of have a doctor down and sit down and take uh, you know, a few hours to diagnose a bunch of images in a row. Okay, um, so in this set, this data set, so we have a small data set and they ask for numbers. So for one of these projects, I'll say the, the number of images that we're working with is on the order of 150 images, right? And from that, I used a test set of 50 images. Now, it, this, this, you cannot take this ratio and now apply it to every task you've ever done, but I wanted some numbers, uh, there it is. So one trick you can use when your data set is super small is to augment your data. And this is very common in imaging tasks. You will actually do this even if you have a large data set. So what this means is I sort of create synthetic data for my original data, right? So I don't just give it my original 25, 50 images, I give it those images plus rotated versions, random cropped versions, versions where I've altered the brightness and the contrast. And these are sort of nice things to do for your model because these are things that uh, us humans can do very well, but the model may not really know how to do, right? I see this image and I understand that if I rotate it 20 degrees to the right, it's still the same image. Um, but your model may not know how to do that. It may not understand, um, you know, just by rotating something, it, it stays the same. Same thing with translation, right? And we can do the same thing. I, we can all see that these are the same image, but maybe the model we're using doesn't. And by adding these photos to the data set, uh, we teach the model to say that these sort of nuisance transformations uh, should be ignored, right? Or if I'm looking for this part of my image, and I rotate the image, this part of the image gets rotated uh, along with it. Okay, so let's look at the actual specific tasks. So one of these tasks, uh, one idea for measuring the health is plotting key points on these images uh, and measuring them how they change over time. The deep learning task here is to take an image and plot some points. So here our image, uh, we have three points on each side. These two images correspond to the device. Here's the end of the device. Here's the like uh, corner of the device. And then this final dot corresponds to the extension of the tissue over the device, okay? So this is nice because, you know, maybe I want to check if this tissue is receding over time, right? Or maybe it's swelling up over time covering the device, okay? So um, I can sort of, use these key points to say something about the health of the eye. And in reality in this project, there are more than just these uh, six key points. There are a few more that are uh, more difficult to find. And while this is in some sense a medical imaging project, uh, key point detection is a very general uh, important task in deep learning and image analysis. Okay. I think in the, the Slack chat, and it mentioned someone asked, you know, if I work on a medical imaging project where these skills translate, uh, the answer is yes, um, because here we have key point detection and key point detection shows up in very hot areas like facial recognition and human pose estimation. Uh, another task one could do is classification like we were doing earlier between dog and cat. We can classify these images between healthy and unhealthy, or maybe 
um, you know, left healthy, right swollen, right? So in this image, I have normal tissue on the left, right swollen, swollen tissue on the right. Um, and so this left-right designation poses a nice extra twist on the classification problem. So this is what I mean by your intuition is needed. I can't just use an out-of-the-box classification. Uh, you need a human sitting there to think you know, long and hard about how to, to deal with a task where I have uh, an image with a mix of different classifications. And this is a good example of why I say that this is sort of an expensive uh, task to label these images, right? Because uh, even I can't really look and, and make a credible uh, claim that this is normal tissue. You know, someone, some doctor or something has to sit down and say, ah, oh, this, this is normal based on my experience. Uh, finally, another task coming from this is to automatically segment or highlight the tissue around the eye, right? This might be useful because maybe you can compute the volume or something more complicated to detect tissue loss or swelling. Uh, so here I show an image that's actually particularly challenging to implement. So this model was only trained on 25 images uh, with ample data augmentation, but still, since I only have 25 unique images, it's getting confused by certain things, right? So it sort of thinks these uh, blobs created by the camera might be tissue. It gets confused by the top and the bottom. So, you know, this is an example of a challenge when I only have 25 images, how do I get something to work right? And this is another task common in lots of areas. It shows up of course in medical imaging, maybe segmenting and detecting tumors and TC scans, but it's also a critical part of self-driving cars. You know, a car needs to understand what is a road, what is street sign, uh, more importantly, what is a pedestrian? Okay, I, I should pause here, any questions about this? All right, let's see. Um, does data augmentation magnify overfitting problems or create other issues with mislabeled data getting propagated? Um, but I mean, potentially, right? I mean, if you have a bunch of mislabeled data, you know, that, that can be an issue. Your model is only as good as what you feed it. So, I mean, of course, if you only augment your mislabeled data, you're gonna get a very bad model. But if you're sort of regularly augmenting everything, you know, maybe it's just as bad as if you didn't augment. But yeah. I, you do have to worry about mislabeled data. Um, one question, is there, is there an issue with, for example, <clears throat> trying to understand something like a cornea on a, on a flat image, whereas maybe there's some underlying rotational symmetries that would be more natural in a, in a kind of um, non-linear embedding of that image. <laughs> yeah, so you mean like we're going from 3D to 2D, right? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, the issue is that 3D pictures are quite big. So we use convolutional neural networks to get around how big 2D images are. 3D images get even bigger. So um, it is definitely possible that by using, um, we actually have these images in order, right? So we have that, we have a 3D scan and we have all these images sort of in, in slices, right? So if you wanted more accuracy and 2D just wasn't cutting it, you could definitely could conceivably start thinking about using, you know, four images at a time. Right, and these four images are all sort of consecutive and trying to, to do the task that way. Or maybe if you shrink the re resolution down and look at the full 3D image, you can take advantage of this sort of uh, 3D rotational symmetry you have in, in three space. But that, again, requires some creativity and some geometric understanding. So I'm, I'm all for advocating for understanding geometry and uh, using it in, in conjunction with deep learning. Uh, I think that, I think we've covered a, many of the questions. Uh, okay, then I'll, I think I just have a, one more cool thing to say and then we'll see if any more pop up. Okay, so where is deep learning and imaging going in the future? So it's definitely not slowing down anytime soon. 
Um, one interesting thing that I think is happening is that much like natural language processing can be pre-trained on this large databases of texts like Wikipedia or the internet, uh, a lot of new work centers around using large databases of unlabeled images to sort of pre-train. So this is what we call self and sometimes semi-supervised learning, right? So using unlabeled data uh, in creative ways to sort of, um, you know, augment your model when you're working with small data sets. Um, another thing is that while convolutional neural networks have been dominating imaging, uh, more creative network architectures are emerging that might soon replace them. Maybe uh, the suggestion from earlier could replace convolutional neural networks. Um, so for example, here's a tweet by the head of AI at Tesla. Uh, this tweet's from last month. He's remarking on a paper called an image is worth 16 by 16 words. Uh, and in the tweet, he says, this paper is V cool, further steps towards depreciating comp nets. Okay? So at least he thinks that, you know, perhaps comp nets will be obsolete at some point. We'll have some new architecture that works better, better on images. Uh, one thing I want to remark here is that I really like the uh, sort of machine learning convention of having really cute paper names. We definitely don't have this in, in math. Um, and I'm definitely not prominent enough to start the trend, but I could just say I really appreciate it. Um, deep learning is also working its way towards more unconventional settings. Um, so while it's amazing, I think for imaging, the holy grail is really finding a way to use all the tools at one's disposal. So neural networks, domain expertise, and then of course, since I'm biased, uh, some geometry. So we saw last week, I think it was that uh, Hilmer discussed combining doctor expertise with deep learning for medical projects, right? So there's some domain expertise. And I'll finish with a project that I hope um, that I'm working on with some mathematician and anthropologist colleagues, where we hope to blend um, some geometric ideas with deep learning because the data set is so small. Okay, so that's where I'll close. Uh, I'll describe this sort of project here with uh, what are looks like a weird rock. So what this image shows, in fact, is a reconstructed stone uh, that an ancient sort of human from the Paleolithic era um, sort of turned into a stone tool. So what it is is you have this rock. And I beat it with another rock, chipping off stone flakes till I get flakes uh, here in the middle that I like, right? Maybe I'll get something that could be a, used for a good arrowhead, okay? And so anthropologists get these massive collection of stone fragments and they wanna put them together and understand um, how, use this sort of uh, 3D puzzle to understand how these stone tools were made, okay? Now, as you, can, as you might imagine, these data sets are very small. So one, it's very hard to find these archeological sites. Two, it's very fine, hard to find complete ones. And three, it's very hard to put these images actually together. Um, on the right here, we actually have a virtual model of this process. So using deep learning and some synthetic data, they were able to create sort of a, what's called a virtual napper. So this process of making the stone tools is called napping. And here we have sort of a virtual version of this where you give it some rock and it will start chipping away at it. Now this model was made with synthetic data and by synthetic data, I mean some anthropologist and his grad students, you know, sat in a circle and uh, beat a bunch of rocks together to create this data, right? So this using this sort of synthetic, I guess this would be a form of data augmentation. They were able to use deep learning. Okay. Um, so our goal is to sort of try look to use the real data and see what we can gain get out of it. And I'll, I'll mention that this screenshot is from a really good presentation by Shannon McFerrin um, on this thing, which I found super interesting. And I can share the link for anyone who's interested later. Okay. Oh, so maybe it makes sense if I show a video of what what we're actually looking life. like. Okay. So gonna be Oops, I want to turn the volume off. And we're live. Okay, so we're going to do Laval one now. Got a nice big chunk of text and fleet. Sorry, this toolbar is blocking me from. Ah, okay, there we go. Okay, so you see that he has the stone and he has a uh, another hard tool, and he beats it and breaks away a flake. 
you know, turns it in some fashion and keeps chipping away at it. So this process continues for, oops. This process continues for some length of time till it gets smaller and smaller, eventually turning into something that might be an arrowhead or a, or a stone ax. Okay. So this is the basic procedure that you know, Paleolithic humans went through to create their tools. So the big challenge here in using real data is, again, these data sets are really small, right? So this is what our anthropologists have, right? So these photos were given to me by a friend of mine at University of Minnesota. Um, and here we have one of her refits that she's working on, which is just a collection of what looks like to me just a bunch of pebbles, but to her, she can very clearly see that these are uh, lithic fragments. And then here we have uh, all the fragments from one particular site. So this could be many different, uh, what they call refit sequences, uh, all jumbled into one. And we have an anthropologist working hard to put together this 3D puzzle. Okay. So you can sort of think about this as someone took, you know, 12 different 3D puzzles, mixed them all together, threw out half the pieces, and then dumped them on the ground for 100,000 years. So this is the data we're working with. Okay. So what anthropologists are doing now is going through and creating 3D models of these fragments. Okay. So we have here a nice 3D rendering of what one of the most complete sequences looks like from start to finish. Now this one's a bit fast, so we'll go through it again. I really like this picture. So where does deep learning come in here? Well, um, one thing we might want to do is given a stone or a fragment, you want to predict two things. Maybe what is the next flake that comes off the stone? Or what was the flake that just came off the stone? Right? What was the previous flake that was just discarded? The reason we want to do this is so that maybe we can help anthropologists understand partial data or, right? So we have some, some collection of stones and there are some holes. Maybe if we have some model that sort of can predict what the last flake looked like, they can get some insight into um, the holes in their data set, right? Or more concretely, maybe we can help anthropologists with reconstruction, right? We have some partially reconstructed sequence we have a model that outputs what is the likely uh, fragment that, that, that goes next, that came off of it, right? They can, then they can go back and look in their huge treasure trove over here and see you know, which one of these looks most like what the model predicted. Okay. Um, and then a little bit more ambitiously is that hopefully we can sort of put all this together and use this to understand uh, differences between these sequences in different sites, right? So what anthropologists really want to do is say, here are a bunch of sequences in um, say Israel, and here are a bunch of sequences um, in say Turkey. And I can tell you that they're done by different cultures or maybe they're done by the same culture, right? And so this is where we sort of hope to blend some machine learning tools along with some geometric tools um, um, and these nice 3D models uh, to glean some insight into this process. Okay. Now, I don't have any cool results yet, but I think that this is uh, a cool challenge. And I think that these are the kinds of things that um, if, you can, if you can start using deep learning to do this, then I think you're really in, heading into some super interesting territory. All right, so that's all I have for everyone. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael, that was great, uh, really, um, nice and, and kind of uh, refreshingly approachable introduction to some of the ideas in deep learning. Um, and so uh, for, for all of our students out there, you'll learn more about this when you take advanced machine learning with Yannette, who's here. Hi, Yannette. Uh, and for anyone here who is um, maybe interested in joining our program, um, we have an information session happening next Tuesday at uh, 9 a.m. and you can sign up for that uh, uh, on our website and, and learn a little bit more about the master's program. Um, I think we are uh, 
yeah, I think this is a, a good place to stop. Uh, so let's thank Michael again. Um, we're uh, giving thunderous applause, Michael. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, hope to see you again soon at the seminar. Yeah. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>